When a threat is too much for the Justice League to handle, it's going to be up to the agents of Task Force X to mete out justice. But what happens when even the members of the Suicide Squad think a mission is too dangerous? Well, let's hop into the pages of Suicide Squad Blaze, a brand new black label mini from Cy Spirier, and find out together, shall we? So then, as we join the book, we're introduced to our narrator, who gives us a very brief history of superheroes in this world. It's black label, so things are similar to the main DC universe, but also different in a number of ways. Specifically, the narrator decides to zero in on subjects of superhumans and death. You see, not everyone is as good as Superman, Batman, or Wonder Woman when it comes to saving lives. Sometimes they screw up, and a lot of people end up dead. Like in the very tragic case of our yet-to-be-named narrator, who, during his early days as a superhero, was trying to stop a shipment of MDMA, but ended up accidentally killing a bunch of people in a resulting car accident. And if you're like me, you're probably thinking, seriously, a bunch of people lost their lives because this dude got a little overzealous stopping club drugs, not cocaine or heroin, but freaking stuff that rich kids do at raves? Yes, it is most certainly that sort of story. Now, that's the past, but in the present, though, something much stranger and horrifying is happening. All over the world, especially in third world countries, people are beginning to disappear, literally stolen into the sky. When their bodies eventually do show up later, they're missing internal organs and pieces of their brain. Yes, it seems that some sort of super-powered cannibal is on the loose and hunting people. This guy probably could have gotten away with these macabre actions if he didn't decide to start turning his attention to the richer, whiter, more western part of the world where eventually the police and the Justice League get involved. Here's the problem, though. Even the likes of Superman are positively stumped as to who or what is exactly doing all of this. They have no evidence, they have no leads, and people are starting to get quite scared and quite on edge, so much to the point that the American government decides to call in Amanda Waller and Task Force X to deal with the problem themselves. And oh hey, would you look at that, Amanda Waller is drawn to look exactly like Deborah Wilson now, the woman who's doing the voice for Amanda Waller in the upcoming video game. Seriously, like, no joke, Deborah Wilson was like one of the first famous women I ever actually had a crush on, and I still kinda do. Waller gathers her regular Suicide Squad, made up of Peacemaker, Harley Quinn, Captain Boomerang, and King Shark, and why, yes, they look even more like their last movie counterparts than normal. As good as these guys usually are, Waller harbors no illusions that whatever they're dealing with this time is a Superman-level threat, and the only way they're going to be able to match up to this super god is if the members of the Suicide Squad are similarly upgraded in their powers. This is where we actually enter the title of the story, The Blaze Protocol, a brand new experimental medical procedure that can give even the most regular of people a amazing godlike superpowers, there's just one giant massive downside, though. You see, the candle that blazes twice as bright ends up burning half as long. You'll have amazing powers, but you'll die in three months. And even though the regular members of the Suicide Squad may have a couple screws loose here and there, they're not dumb. They already risk their lives enough for Waller. They're not going to go ahead with this. Which means Waller is quickly going to have to enact her Plan B. What's Plan B? Well, start off offering the Blaze Protocol to non-supervillain members of the Bell Rev prisoner community, starting with one Michael Van Zant, aka our narrator, aka that superhero who got all those people killed. Make no mistake, this might be called Suicide Squad Blaze, but Michael here is the actual main character. At first, he turns down the offer, figuring the whole thing is pretty stupid. He's busy working on himself right now, and even if he did think going out in a blaze of glory would give him redemption, he doesn't want to do it. That is, of course, until the powers that be make reference to the fact that Michael's ex-girlfriend, a woman by the name of Tanya, is also being looked into for the project. He quickly changes his tune. Now, just because Michael agreed to the procedure doesn't mean he's going to get it. There's only so many shots of Blaze to go around, so Waller has decided to have tryouts. Inmates from both sides of the prison fill the yard, and their mission is simple. If you want godlike powers for the next three months, all you have to do is make it past the regular Suicide Squad, who are able to stop you using lethal force. Most of the rank-and-file crooks end up getting killed right away, but some of them prove just how nasty and clever they can be. There's Lucille, a woman with a clear death wish who manages to make it past Captain Boomerang by simply creeping him out. Zavi, an old-school jock, manages to brute force his way past Harley Quinn. Boris, an elderly inmate of the prison, manages to trick King Shark by spreading his blood on some other inmates to keep him busy. 
Tanya herself proves to be a master manipulator by getting a bunch of the other inmates to rush Waller, which in turn causes her to pull the squad back to protect her. And then there's Michael himself, who is able to crawl on his hands and knees and get where he needs to go with no one paying attention to him, because, well, no one seems to pay a lot of attention to him, period. And with that, it seems like we finally have assembled our new suicide squad within a suicide squad. They get the Blaze procedure done to them, and before you can say origin story, they are all endowed with amazing powers, though the book actively goes out of its way to not tell you what everyone can do right away. Some of them have energy projections, some of them seem to phase in and out of reality, Boris has been given supervision, but poor Michael, well, both of his arms went invisible. Doesn't exactly seem like a god-level power, but as we find out throughout the rest of the story, some of them also have enhanced healing, which is always good in the grab bag of superpowers. Now, Waller just can't send these people out into the field just yet to catch a superpowered serial killer, so she decides to give each of them a Suicide Squad member mentor. And Harley ends up getting paired with Tanya, who we've already seen is incredibly manipulative, which, you know, makes you really think what her relationship with Michael was like before they both went to prison. Harley doesn't like her either. And when she tries to get inside the clown princess's head, she opts to just stab her in the eye a few times, which is how we find out that they can heal. Now, being a superpowered suicide soldier for the government also comes with some nice fringe benefits before they actually go off on this mission they are given their final meal. This is where Michael takes the opportunity to size up all the people he's going to be working with. Boris doesn't really say much, but has quite a few nuggets of wisdom that only come with age. Zavi actually seems a little bit more well-read than Michael first assumed he was. Lucille is a bit of an enigma. In fact, she didn't get a Suicide Squad mentor, which makes everyone suspect that there's something weird up with her. After dinner's over, they all get piled into a plane and sent about their mission. It's here that Boris opens up to Michael and says what he thinks is actually going on here. That the mission they're on has nothing to do with stopping a killer and everything to do with maintaining the status quo. There are so many superpowered individuals in the world that are given so much leeway by the government and the powers that be. But now that there seems to be a cannibal superhuman striking at random, people are beginning to completely reevaluate their stance on super beings to begin with. And if they're not careful and get results soon, this could end up completely changing the very nature of the world that everyone lives in. So, you know, no pressure. Now, the plan to lure out this mysterious killer is simple. They're going to drop a bunch of bodies from their plane that they think are filled with a certain type of pheromone that this killer is going to like, and the Suicide Squad is going to lay in wait and ambush the killer when he comes to eat. This plan actually ends up working too well as the killer is on them a lot quicker than they thought. As far as what this guy looks like, it seems that he's made of smoke or clouds and moves incredibly fast. It's during the fight too, Michael learns just exactly what an ice cold operator Waller is. You see, the reason Lucille never actually got a Suicide Squad mentor is because they assumed with her death wish she was going to die right away in this battle anyway. This is why Waller was sure to spike her blood with an experimental isotope that the team could track later in case their target got away from them. And they're probably going to need that edge too, as as the comic comes to a close, the mysterious killer ends up crushing poor Boris's head right in front of Michael. Keep in mind, this dude was the wisest of the new Suicide Squad and had supervision, which means he probably should have seen that coming, but still didn't. It's only here, too, when it's much too late do Michael and the others learn a horrible truth about the Blaze procedure, and that is, well, it kind of works like Highlander. When one person with the Blaze inside them dies, the power ends up dispersing and going into the other Blaze recipients. They become way more powerful, but the short time they have left ends up getting even shorter. And so that was Suicide Squad Blaze issue number one, everybody. I certainly applaud the book for being a different kind of black label story. Not only is it not focusing on Batman for a change, but Spurrier and company are actually having fun playing around with the very concept of the Suicide Squad. Death is always on the table for them, but it's never usually so apparent. The art is certainly fun, it's darker and more atmospheric and very thematic to the sort of gritty superhero story that they're telling. I just can't shake the feeling after reading issue one that this is probably going to end up being one of those stories that you're going to like and is going to make a lot more sense when you read it and trade. Overall, I'd feel comfortable giving this one a 7.5 out of 10. It was pretty cool and there's a good chance you're probably going to like it as well, especially if you're looking for something a little different in your Suicide Squad flavor. 
Hey there everyone, Cape Jewel again, and I want to thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. As always, if you liked what you see, be sure to like, subscribe, comment. It really helps drive engagement and helps me out too. Also, if you are a patron, which you can become for as little as a dollar a month, you will get exclusive content that no one else can ever see, and you'll get to see the Comic Multiverse podcast before anyone else too. You can check out all this and more down in the description. And until next time everyone, this has been Cape Jewel, and I'll see you all next time. Cheers.